Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I'll start with um, thanking the uh, uh, Digital Future Initiative. So if you're not familiar with what that is, it's a new initiative in the Columbia Business School. It's sponsoring this event, so your meals are sponsored by um, the Digital Future Initiative. So it's, it's, it's our uh, new think tank focused on um, uh, preparing you and students in the community to lead through digital transformation, which is obviously uh, important these days, um, as well as helping organizations, governments, and we'll be talking a little bit about their role today, uh, help um, understand and leverage uh, from future waves of uh, digital innovation. So this is brand new. You're going to see more events here and more research sponsored by the DFIs. The uh, school is really committed to that. So thank you for joining us today, and thank you to the DFI uh, for supporting us today. Um, so uh, now we'll, we'll get into it. So this is um, a, a talk about digital privacy. Um, so if, or how many of you open up a Columbia web page and you see literally every time you open up the Columbia, you see your, you accept cookies every single time. So if you're wondering why that's the case, like you're, you're in the right space, or every time you download an app, uh, Apple asks you to approve or not approve uh, what data you, they track. Um, while you're using the app. Um, so this is why we're here today. And I think it's fair to say that we uh, likely all acknowledge, and we can debate it today, that in some regards, we're very comfortable giving up our right to privacy in exchange for the free services that we get back um, from the internet. Um, so um, the question is, like, well, there are things that are happening now that are changing these, these dynamics that have been pervasive for a couple of decades. So one is uh, increased government regulation. So we're going to talk a little bit about, or maybe a lot of, about that um, today. Um, two is changes in platforms, primarily Apple, uh, which uh, has less to lose from uh, restricting how data in, is used uh, around the internet, particularly for advertising purposes, um, who are leading with a privacy first platform approach. Uh, and then, of course, those implications, those, those two um, changes have implications on how companies uh, react and how uh, companies like Google or like uh, advertisers or media companies um, address these things. Uh, so it's, I would contend that if any of you are interested in going into a career in media, uh, in technology, or in advertising, Understanding fundamentally what's happening uh, uh, today is something that you must need to know. It is, a, it is a must have. I don't think you should be working with these companies and not have a working understanding of what's going on today. So hence, um, we're here. We're here with Professor Anu Bradford and uh, Michael Hahn from the IB. So I'm going to introduce uh, both of them in a little bit more detail. Um, so Professor Bradford uh, is one of our own. Uh, she's a member of the uh, Columbia Law School since 2012, I think we just heard, uh, where you're the director of the European Legal Studies Center, um, as well as a senior scholar at the Chazen Institute for Global Business. Um, Pre-academia, Professor Bradford did a stint practicing antitrust uh, law and EU law um, and was an advisor to the Parliament of Finland. Uh, and more recently, uh, as, um, as we were just discussing, if you overheard us, um, she's an author of a book called The Brussels Effect, and how the European Union rules the, rule, how the, European Union rules the world. Um, so a question, um, what's more fun? Being a practicing law, teaching law, or writing about law? So I, I definitely uh, would say that they're all fun in their own different ways, but there's a reason I've chosen to teach and write for a living. And, uh, and I think it's just one of those that when you land in the job, that, that you don't even treat it as a job. I would do it regardless every morning, and I, I just think it's, it's absolutely thrilling. At the same time, like, like business school, like law school, it's a trade school. And I think you need to understand what's happening in, in business. So that's why I'm particularly excited always when I have the opportunity to engage in conversation with people who are doing it in the real world. And I'm very grateful for what I learned in the, in the law firm. That's great. Thank you. Well, welcome, and thank you for coming here. So Michael, um, <clears throat> Michael Hahn is the <clears throat> excuse me, Executive Vice President, General Counsel at, 
Council at the IAB. So the IAB is the Interactive Advertising Bureau. It's an organization that supports uh, media and marketing industry uh, to thrive in the digital economy. Now, if you're not familiar with that organization, that's what they do. Um, I spent the time actually serving as a board capacity with some of the things the IAB too, so I know them uh, very well. Um, so at the IAB, Michael is responsible for all legal matters, uh, including the direction of legal strategy, privacy compliance, antitrust compliance, if privacy wasn't big enough, um, uh, amongst other things. Um, he By the way, that's what happens when you're not enough. <laughs> right. Gotta do it all. I do employment too. <laughs> um, well, that's true. As general counsel, I guess you would cover it all as well. Um, you, so you lead the IB Legal Affairs <clears throat> Council, um, which includes 350 lawyers focused on solving the systemic legal challenges that we're um, here talking about today. Um, so this is why Michael has joined us. Before before the IB, um, you were the vice chair of the antitrust practice group at Lowenstein and Sammer. <clears throat> You were co-chair of the New Jersey State Bar Association for Antitrust Law Committee. Uh, and you're the editorial advisory board. You served on the editorial advisory board of Competition Law 360 uh, and the advisory board for the American Bar Association Antitrust section, Sections for Civil Torts and RICO Committee. You've, you've had a lot going on, for sure. So let me ask you, what's more fun, antitrust law or privacy law? Ooh, it's like. Uh pulling me in two different directions from two parts of my life. Uh, well, you know, right now I, I think it's, uh, they're, they're both areas that are evolving, especially in the United States, rapidly. Uh, and in fact, one of the things I think we're going to talk about today is the intersection between yeah. both of those concepts, which is, is critical. We will. But I have to say, these days I'm, I'm having more fun in the privacy space. I, I like to think of it as, you know, back when the original antitrust statute was passed in the United States in the early 1900s, which is the Sherman Antitrust Act, there was no body of law as to how it applied. And it took basically a century of evolution for it to get to where it is today, which is still even evolving. And right now in privacy law, in particular in the United States, we're really just at the beginning, which is exciting and fun uh, and presents a lot of opportunities. Hmm. Exciting, maybe. <clears throat> Fun. Like, well, we'll find out, right? Um, so I'm the, your moderator for today. So I'm Chris LaSalle. I'm a senior lecturer in discipline here at Columbia, uh, coming off of a, a nearly two-decade career um, at Google. Uh, while I was at Google, I, I played a variety of roles over that time. <clears throat> but more recently, I was responsible for their commercial go-to-market efforts for their ad tech products, uh, particularly focusing on the sell side. So for those of you that don't speak that language, uh, what that means uh, when I say the sell side is I was responsible for helping publishers monetize their ad inventory with Google's tools and, and their products. Which also meant I was <clears throat> somewhat in the epicenter of a lot of what Google was trying to do as we managed these privacy laws. Uh, we struggled with how can we make sure that our products and the products that we offer our customers are compliant with the law, not only the law, but the EU law, the US law, the X law, the X law around the world, uh, while also innovating and providing value to our customers um, and growing revenue. For, I mean, that's what you do or expected to do to provide shareholder value. So, so we were thinking, like, well, how do I balance all these things to meet all of those needs? Because you had to comply with the law while you tried to meet those two other objectives. Um, so you might ask, well, we're a business school, and we're sitting in a business school. Um, why did I invite two lawyers to join us today? Um, because these were, not these two people in particular, but their counterparts at Google, uh, were uh, one of our biggest partners as we thought through what should our product roadmap look like? How should we develop products? How should we think about it? Uh, and their advice was crucial to what we're doing. Um, so that's why I'm so excited to have uh, both of you here today. And I'm going to stop talking pretty soon and just let them um, go at it with some questions. So I am prepared uh, to, with some questions. Right. But um, you paid to be here, paid to be in this building, and paid to be in this room. Uh, and I would encourage you to bring your own questions to the forefront. Of I don't need, I have this, I don't need to, to use this. Right. So this really is for you. They've generously given their time up to spend time with you, so we'd like to hear 
from you as well. So I know it usually takes some warming up. But hopefully somebody will, will get us going as well. But I will start us uh, with an easy question, or maybe not so easy question. Um, as I, I mentioned when we, in my opening remarks, users are very comfortable with this notion of being tracked online and the value exchange that we have. Um, do they really care? So you've both, you're involved in this. I'll start with you, Anu. Do users care that their information is being tracked online? So I would say that there's not a uniform answer, even if I tried all of you in this, in this classroom to sort of measure what, like, from scale to 1 to 10, how do you value the importance of privacy? I think I would get a range of answers. So I don't think there's a uniform view, and it's partially it's cultural. So I think Europeans right. care more about <clears throat> privacy than Americans do, and we can talk in a moment why that is the case. But I would say that there's also a temporal element, that if we had asked this question a decade ago, we would answer it differently. And I would say today, users care about privacy more than they used to. So first of all, I think we have a better understanding of what privacy means and what is at stake, how we are being tracked, and what are the downsides when we lose that privacy. So there's certainly a very different societal conversation. So first of all, we've had enough privacy scandals so we have the Snowden revelations. We understand that we are being surveilled by governments and the companies are part of that, that way of harnessing the information that does then compromise uh, individuals' personal autonomy and privacy when we are subject to broader surveillance. We have much more sophisticated understanding of surveillance capitalism when private companies are tracking us for the purpose of extracting that personal data and monetizing that in the commercial space. And, and also then what sort of that, that means when it goes wrong, when we have Cambridge Analytica scandal, when we learn that there's been information of us extracted through Facebook and leveraged to be used in political uh, campaigns. So I think we now have a better understanding of what it means. But at the same time, when there are various surveys being, uh, when individuals are asked how much they care about privacy, Generally, people tend to think that privacy is important. But then when they're asked to trade off, for instance, right. would you rather than pay for the products, right. which you now get for free, when you don't really get anything for free because you are giving your data in return. But I think we get to really interesting questions, like if all of you now ask, are uh, given the option of subscribing to social media or giving up your data, I think we're getting to very interesting conversation. For instance, could those who can afford to care about the privacy then use the subscription model, whereas the ones who cannot afford to use that, they continue to pay with their data. So those are just few initial reactions, but I don't think there's a uniform answer, but yes, I think users increasingly care. And let me just add one more thing. Even if the user doesn't care, should the governments care if they feel that they have a better understanding, this is more like a regulatory paternalism, that the user may not be very informed and fully appreciate what it means when so much of your data is being extracted and the way your data is being used. So it also gets to the question, how much information users have right. to answer that question in a very intelligent yeah, way. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to hold that thought yep. and then go deeper on in a second. So um, Michael, publishers are members of the IAB, just as advertisers are. Uh, so are you seeing, to a news point, um, and I'll ask for your opinion, do users care as well? So please answer that. Uh, but are you starting to see publishers increasingly shift to a paid model from an ad model uh, as a reaction uh, to what's happening? Well, you know, those are kinds of things that one could truly only answer from doing a study. I know that uh, initially that there was an increase in, in subscriptions and paywalls initially uh, after the enactment of, of GDPR. There was also... Uh, a certain response where a number of publishers said, not worth the compliance effort. I'm not deep enough into the marketplace right. to take on the compliance burden and said, we're just not going to offer services in, in the jurisdiction. Um, I, you know, I certainly don't think that the, the burden is of the same level, some of which we're going to talk about even as we move into uh, some of the really significant privacy laws that are evolving in the United States. It, getting to your question, people care about privacy. Certainly, uh, there are different cultural contexts. Uh, you know, even as you look across different privacy laws around the globe, they actually have some really big differences. Uh, 
Some of those differences are the result of different cultural contexts that exist and the value that's placed on privacy. And I might even say that even within the United States, depending where you are, there are different values that are placed on, on, on privacy. Um, but it does get to the question, what does it mean for uh, one to say, I care about my privacy? And that is largely undefined. While privacy laws are beginning to put definitions on it, I'm not sure that those are the right definitions at the end of the day, right? So for example, in the US, we are moving towards a more disclosure-based model. The more companies that touch your data, the less privacy you're deemed to have. And there's certain rights that you get with that. Well, our job is to comply with the law, period. But one might stop and think, is that really the way in which we want to define privacy rights? Do I care that 20 small companies might have personal information? And by that, I might mean a synonymous ID, like an ID that relates to your device combined with some other data attributes? Or am I OK if it's really just one really big company that has detailed information? It could be just. Take a, take a publisher. You've logged in. They've got your detailed information. They know what pages you're visiting. And let's say they don't even send your information anywhere else. People so you're, you're deep, like deep into the tech, because that's where you live every day, for sure. I'd be curious for the, for the audience. When Michael talks about the number of companies that touch your data, um, and I'd like your, to you to sort of judge the, the answers to the students. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, if you were to. Go to the New York Times and view an ad. How many of you think only the, maybe the New York Times is a great example, but we'll use it. How many of you think only the New York Times has access to your data? Raise your hand. How many of you think maybe five companies would have access to your data? Right, roughly. How many think it would be more than 20? What's the answer, Michael? It's more than 20. More than 20. But, but right. I guess where I'm going with the, this question is that some people would say, well, we need to move to a world of you know, what we'll call first party data, where you are served ads solely based on your experience in, uh, in the publisher realm, and that there'd be a more limited set of parties who could touch the data. Now, obviously, there's an implication. The value goes down of, of the ad impression, which means maybe they have to increase the subscription portion of it, or it changes the economic model. I'm not suggesting that one way is right or wrong. I just pose the question of, is it the number of companies that makes one feel <clears throat> concerned about privacy? Or are you more comfortable with less companies, but who have even more detailed information about you? I don't have an answer to that. That's a very subjective question. Well, I mean, again, we, but let's query. You suggested we could query the class. So let's query the class. I'll give you three options to choose. So don't raise your hand until you hear all the options. So option one is um, you don't care. You understand the trade-offs when you access a service, and you don't really care what a company does with your data. Number two is you care deeply or somewhat deeply but you feel that you have no recourse because the services that you're accessing are so fundamentally important to what you do every day, you just deal. You care, but you deal. And number three is um, you are sort of indifferent, and you don't even, you don't even and maybe like, there's a selection bias here, but you're indifferent, and you don't even want to think about it. So one, you don't care. Two, you care deeply, but you can't do anything about it. Right? And three, you're just indifferent. Who's one? Cali is one. So who cares deeply but can't do anything about it? Mm. Interesting. All right. Callie, why don't you care? I wrote about this in my last assignment. Um, I, I used to work at Google as well and worked in a privacy adjacent marketing team. And I feel like it's just we're, we're a little bit too far gone to care as much as we and the data has been collected and it's been used, and it's been used in ways we probably like. You know, we, like raise your hand if you bought something off Instagram. Yeah, me. And, it, and so I feel like right now, I've 
I've it's been more advantageous in my life than a deodorant, mm -hmm. and I'm not particularly scared of the adverse effects because I understand how it's being used. I think what when we when we get into trouble is the general population does not, and I think that's why there's so much fear is because there's just so much ambiguity. Well, I think you're right. So your classmates would suggest that there is a lot of fear. I think the the rest of the class. I didn't ask the three. Who picked number three? Who picked anyone? So no one picked three. So the vast majority, with the exception of Cali. Care. Right, so maybe then we can get back to the point that you were making earlier, Anu. So maybe the government should, should step in. So let's start with the EU. It's my understanding, and this could be wrong, you could correct me, that privacy law really started with the EU, and then there were some fast followers in the US. It was CCPA, and what came after that? Uh, BCDPA. Yeah, okay, so we're going. Uh, Connecticut. So let's start with Europe. Why did they step in? Why, why do the Europeans care? So there's, first of all, there's generally Europeans are more comfortable with regulating than Americans. So if we just think about it, it's not just privacy that the Europeans are regulating. They're regulating the environment and like consumer products more, more generally consumer safety, food safety. Uh, but then within the tech, we have more uh, regulation and antitrust in AI, um, you know, uh, platform workers. So generally, why does Euro Europe regulate? Is that there's less of this American conviction that free markets are the best solution. We trust companies to self-regulate. There's less of a fear that the government will make things worse by interfering. So there's this idea there's more faith in government and less faith in, in the markets in general. But then if we zoom into privacy in particular, um, so Europeans have historical reasons to care about privacy because Europeans understand what happens when you lose privacy. So if you think about the darkest periods of European history, and you go back to Second World War, and you go back to uh, Holocaust, how did the Nazis manage to uh, uh, do what they did? was because they got access to private data to identify who were Jews. And then if you think about not only that horrific period was a result of the invasion of privacy to identify individuals and then to persecute them, then there was also, in the, during the communism, uh, in, in Germany, again, we look at why they care so much about, there was Stasi. So there was basically the, the, the East German intelligence agency that was surveying people, that basically people were under constant surveillance. Again, a major infringement of privacy. So the Europeans uh, understand what it means when their population does not have autonomy and when they do not have privacy. And I think that also then spills into the sort of the twofold concern. So we don't trust governments to have that data, but also then the idea that we don't trust the companies to have that data because we don't always know. I, I take your word that some of that may be very low stakes compared to what I was just saying, that it's used in advertising in the way that some of us may not like it or some, of, some may be indifferent to it, some may think it's beneficial to us, but ultimately there are so many ways that data in the wrong hands or with the wrong motivations can be used in a way that can be harmful. And I think Europeans are just particularly attuned to those dangers, which is why then the privacy has taken a, a very different meaning in the European context. So um, let's get a little bit more narrow at the risk of boring our, our audience. But GDPR, um, what is it, the, the DMA or the DSA, or they're both of them? They're both. They're both, The right. Digital Markets Act is this European ex-ante regulation on gatekeepers, so it's an antitrust regulation, and Digital Services Act, another big regulation that is more about content moderation. So those are the biggest ones, but the GDPR is the, the one that we've started. So what is in 30 seconds or less, what do they need to know about GDPR? So what you need to know, I think everybody actually knows a lot about the GDPR. That's often the, the question is that what they know about the EU regulation is the GDPR. So I think that the main, uh, the zest of the GDPR is it's trying to sort of give you a agency over your data. That is based on this idea that it's your choice, it's your consent that the companies need to have. So the companies need to have a legal basis for, for using your data. And one of the main ways of, ex of, of um, uh, receiving that, that legal basis or showing you have the legal basis is that you, you have an informed consent by the user that your data is being used. And then there is the, the limitations of what you can then do if you get that consent. So you get that consent, but you only use it for that purpose. You don't store it indefinitely. So you limit the way you process the data, you, you deploy the data, 
But there are many sort of aspects I would probably mention too if I, if I highlight of the GDPR. One is this kind of privacy by design, that there's an expectation that the companies at the outset build their products so that you are respectful of privacy. That's a very fundamental way that sort of steers the product development. So if Apple builds its phone at the outset to be GDPR compliant, then you don't need to be enforcing at every moment of, of how- Which is uh, what we're seeing in the web. Which we are seeing, exactly. And the second, there are uh, certain provisions that have become very high profile, like the right to be forgotten. So there are these ideas that you have the right to ask certain information about you that is no longer relevant, that is no accurate, to be deleted. So there are provisions like that that, that can be seen as far reaching, but at the same time, the idea is that we empower the individual in the name of the self-determination and autonomy to have more control over data that right. is about you. So permission and control over data and then limit how the data is used, yeah. right? And um, so now I'll ask you, right? So the implementation of that has been, in my opinion, suboptimal, right? The, particularly in an HTML environment, in a browser environment, um, we've become blind to these accept cookies, accept cookies in all contexts, not just Columbia. Um, so, so I guess two questions, is the implementation working, right? is it achieving the in intention that Anu talked about? Um, and as it's spread, GDPR has spread into other, um, other regimes, so the US being one, but others around the world, uh, how is it morphing and changing? Well, let, let, let's start with the implementation. I mean, the implementation is largely driven by the law itself, and, you know, I think Europe did a, uh, an amazing thing in sort of taking the lead to develop a generally applicable privacy law. And while it is, I would say, something that has inspired laws around the globe, lessons have been learned. And not everyone is doing exactly what Europe is doing. The user experience is very much a result of the law, so you need to get consent for a number of activities by each activity, by each party who's performing those activities, which frankly is well beyond the capability, knowledge, and time anyone's willing to invest. If you think that you're going to really spend the time to look at a cookie notice that appears, think about all of those companies that are involved in a digital ad data flow that we just talked about before, and I'm going to provide consent to these companies that I haven't heard of. Am I just going to click them all or not click any of it? It makes an informed judgment very difficult. So on that point, is it, is it actually true that the law is written to get complete informed consent? <clears throat> and this might have been true when, when I was there a few years ago. That you would, as a user, have to say yes to Google, and then yes to DataZoo, and yes to LiveRamp, and yes to, and yes to, none of those companies you probably have ever heard of, and there's 50 more. Is that, was that the strict interpretation of the law? Well, you know, the, the law is evolving, right? And, and we keep getting more decisions from regulators, and that is, we received uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a report from the ICO a few years ago, which suggested consent was really the main basis one needed to rely upon in digital advertising rather than some of the alternative bases in the law, because the law itself doesn't say, here's how it applies in digital advertising. Right. So it takes That's time right. for this to evolve. And we, we recently got a decision in the last year from uh, the Belgian regulator, and that is going up to the European Court of Justice about who is a, who is a, what we call a controller who determines the purpose and means of processing in a digital ad transaction. And it gets, it gets complicated real quick. But the way it's being deployed is with a great deal of specificity. And so that is driven by the law, the regulations about how it applies. And so, for example, my organization is conducting an event in Europe. And so, if we're putting together a page right now that talks about sharing information with the sponsors. So someone needs to come to our page who registers and say, I'm going to opt into the sharing of my personal information with this sponsor, that sponsor, the next sponsor, and the list goes on. If you just said all sponsors, that would be a problem. So 
it requires a lot of time and investment is, is the point. And I'm not sure that most consumers want to make that right. investment. And you know, that is something that is going to have to play out over time. And I do think that other jurisdictions are learning some of the lessons from that. The US, while it has been inspired by GDPR in five different states that have enacted privacy laws, it looks very different. It's an opt-out model. So that means that you actually, the, the use of your personal information will uh, continue until such time as you opt out. There are other jurisdictions in the world. Uh, actually, one of the ones I've been most impressed with is Singapore, which tries to find some middle ground between there. And these really reflect, I think, at the end of the day, the cultural norms that you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's fair. This might be um, a good opportunity for you to educate the the audience on how this is working with the slides you've prepared. Sure. So as I, I like to go back to my, my first year of law school in, in civil procedure where uh, I remember the first year law professor. Where tell, is this going, Michael? I'll tell you where it's going. <laughs> right, right. He said, he said you, you have to know what the facts are in order right. to apply the rules. That's right. And if you really want to think about how the law applies, what is the right thing to do, you have to know what the data is. And so what I've tried to provide here is, is a basic overview of a ubiquitous data flow that happens in digital advertising. So let's start with the advertiser, shoestyle.com. They're the ones who are in the marketplace and saying, I want to buy an ad. I want to reach runners who buy shoes or uh, snow boots. So what they do is send personal, what they do, I'm sorry, is send uh, information to an ad server. It's not personal information, but there is a company they hire called an ad server. They're going to hold what's called an ad creative. That ad creative is basically the image that you see. Now, if we went back 50 years ago, shoestyle.com would have simply gone to the New York Times and said, here's my ad creative put it in the newspaper. But now that it has to be held at with the ad server. That ad server is going to send something called an ad tag. It is a little piece of code that will ultimately direct, when it gets onto the publisher site, it's, it's basically directions about where to grab the ad from. So that ad tag goes from the ad server to something called a DSP, which is the demand side platform. Demand side platforms have relationships with advertisers. And what they're essentially doing is helping the advertiser bid on inventory as part of an ad campaign. So shoestyle.com goes to the DSP and says, I'm trying to reach middle-aged runners who are interested in, in buying sneakers. And they're going to do their best to try to find the right bidding opportunity. So now we have a user that goes to a connected device. It could be a uh, connected television, like a Roku, or uh, it, it could be on your laptop, you're opening up the web, or your mobile phone. So you have a, you have a publisher who's going to present content. And then there, there's that space there for the ad. And so this is the first time we're seeing personal information flow in the digital ad ecosystem. So that publisher is going to work with its own publisher ad server. And it's going to provide some personal information about the consumer, like your device ID, if you're on a phone, your IP address, if you're on your laptop. And it's going to send that to the publisher ad server. That publisher ad server is going to start the process of saying, let's have a bid for this advertisement. So that particular user, they might be that runner, they might not be that runner who is interested in, in buying shoes. The SSP is a supply side platform. They're aggregating inventory on the supply side. And they're going to ultimately put out a, a bid. So the ad server is saying, I've got a publisher. I want you, SSP, to put out a bid request. That SSP then sends a bid request, again, with this personal information about we've got 
a user here with this particular device ID. They don't actually know who the person is directly. And, uh, and we've got certain information about them. Maybe they were on the runner's, they're on the runner's world site or uh, they could have other defined attributes about that person's uh, um, profile. Well, and to that point, <clears throat> likely what would show up as, as part of this information would be exactly what you said. Not only you were, you were at the runner's site, but you actually were at Zappos looking at running shoes and you were actually somewhere else, all tied together by some identifier, which was a third party cookie until like recently as they go away. So there's a lot more complexity in the left side of this page about all the data that's collected. Now, it doesn't include PII, correct? Like, but it could. PII meaning it could include your name and email address and phone number. It typically doesn't, but it very well could. Is that fair? It, it could. It could. And it, and it depends on the, the system and, and the setup. Okay. But, but typically, that's, that's not I the, just wanted to like, make sure we all understood what we're, we're looking at. Um, so the SSP sends the bid request, again, it's got that personal data in there, to the DSP. The DSP says, okay, I've seen this ID somewhere before. I'm going to go into what's called an identity graph and see if I can identify somewhere this ID. And if I see that ID and it's associated with runners and I've got a, uh, a complex profile associated with the ID, it might fit within the campaign that shoestyle.com wanted to bid on. And it becomes something that's more valuable. And in a real fully baked data flow, there would be half a dozen or so different DSPs right. that would be bidding on this opportunity. Otherwise, the page gets pretty crowded uh, pretty quick. But basically, they need to bid on behalf of the advertiser for the opportunity to deliver an ad. So then the DSP sends back its bid response, and there would be a half a dozen other DSPs also sending their bid response back. There's an auction that happens, and the winning bidder then gets sent to the publisher ad server along with that ad tag that we saw in the beginning of the data flow. And then the ad tag is sent to the publisher site, and then the publisher site now says, ah, OK, I've got the instructions that code fires and goes to the advertiser ad server and grabs the ad creative, and you, you finally see the ad. This is what happens in the blink of an eye. Right. Um, so there's a lot of data that is, is moving around in this process. And so this is what we deal with on a daily basis to say, this system was designed for efficiency. It is not like somebody mapped this out. You were probably there much earlier than, than I was as, as the digital ad ecosystem evolved. What was the goal? The goal was to do actually what the antitrust laws were designed to do, to lower prices for advertisers and increase output. But there was a byproduct from all of this data flow, which was some loss of privacy, which is what the privacy laws are designed for. But our job now as an industry is to say, how do we take this complicated set of data flows and make it work with these privacy laws? That's our obligation. That's the law. And that's so, what we do. So now I'm going to pause here and go a little bit deeper on, you suggested earlier that the governments need to step in. They sort of have, they see something that the audience perhaps doesn't see, and I think they see this. Is this why government stepped in? Yes, yeah, so partially there is that the, the participants of this graph are motivated by their business interests. Profit motive. So it is, it's all about profits, and ultimately I'm not sure that they are like all trying to extract the data in a way that would be intentionally harmful, Correct. but they don't care about the byproduct the same way that they would, they would factor in the externalities or the factor in the kind of consumer harm that is not a, a, a sort of necessary part of their business model and that the governments on behalf of the individuals are factoring in their calculus on how the personal data ought to flow and how it ought to be protected in the process. So ultimately there is this idea that the regulators step in because they care about the broader public interest which is not necessarily aligned 
with the, with the private company. So sometimes you can say that those two can be aligned. So now you mentioned yourself, Apple, being a sort of distinctly pro-privacy platform. And, and one could say that, well, do you really need them to have government to step in? Or will the markets keep, these companies keep each other in check? So Apple will build its devices so that it basically forces greater privacy because it does give users the opportunity to choose not to be tracked. So this is an example where the government is not in the marketplace, yet we see movement towards greater privacy. But even there, the question would be that, do we trust ultimately that we our privacy is only protected as long as it is consistent with the business motive of Apple? Because ultimately, this is something that Apple can use, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis competitors like Meta that is more dependent right. on the data. And, and that's why where the government sees its role as, as stepping in because we cannot fully outsource it to the, the, the companies whose motivations are different. Yeah, I mean, and <clears throat> like putting my, <clears throat> my old Google hat back on, um, skeptically, um, it's no surprise that Apple is trying to build an ad network again. So are Apple's motivations very pure, just on your behalf from privacy, or are they looking to essentially aggregate first party data that then can't be shared with other third parties that use the platform? So 10 years from now, Apple has a $100 billion ad business, and others don't. Don't know. It's not the discussion for today. But that's also yet another perspective, and that's what a skeptic would say. I have one uh, question, and then I'm going to pivot. One more question sort of related to this diagram, um, because I'm confused. So if you were to just break this down to one publisher and one data, uh, one, one user. <clears throat> so Facebook is what I'm going to ask about. Um, Recently, it was the Dutch court, right? They found that Meta did not have lawful basis to process their own users' data for ad talk. Sorry. So forget all of these yellow flows back and forth ad server. I look at Facebook. I tell you what I'm interested in. Facebook serves an ad back to me. No one else is involved. Yet a Dutch court said, no, you can't use the data in that way. Why? Am I, first, am I explaining it correctly? And why? Yeah, and you're tapping into actually a very big debate that is going, and this is not just the Dutch court. There have been other decisions right now and big battles where there's disagreement across different privacy regulators on, on how this issue ought to be solved as a matter of law and, and what is kind of consistent with the understanding of legal basis as required by the GDPR. So there the question is that, that Facebook basically has had it embedded in the, the terms of service that when you consent to use Facebook, you do consent also to the revenue model, which is targeted advertising. But you don't specifically spell it out to the user that by consenting to use uh, Facebook, it actually entails that you also consent to the way we engage in targeted advertising. So it goes back to what I said earlier, that for the consent to be informed, you actually need to understand what the stakes are. It's not only that there's some random terms, and, and everybody probably has not read the, the detailed terms of service when they sign on to, to Facebook. No, no one has. Exactly. So that, that's, that's why the question is that they need to uh, separately make sure that the user understand what it entails and also gives the content, uh, consent to targeted advertising. So it doesn't say that Facebook is not allowed to do that. It says that Facebook needs to also have the legal basis for that particular aspect. And if you then think about how Facebook can acquire that consent, it's most likely it would need to ask the users, give the users the option to opt out of targeted advertising. Say, yes, I use Facebook. You may even say that I need to consent to some advertising. But the idea that it's going to be based on your own history, so it's targeted, it's using your personal data, you need to solicit their consent for that. So this is playing out in the court of law, and there's a debate. So there's no answer yet. Yes, there's, there's some disagreement between one of the main privacy watch uh, 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 the enforcers, which the, uh, the Irish Data Protection yep. Agency has taken a somewhat different view uh, than the Dutch have taken here, and the European Privacy Board, the, the big regulator that has also kind of sided uh, alongside with the, the, uh, the Dutch court. So I think it's fair to state, um, and what I'm hearing is that to have governments regulate something as complicated as this, and in other industries that GDPR would, would impact, is hard to do. The intentions are good. 
the, the execution is difficult. Um, in most industries, they, can, they prefer to self-regulate. Right? So one, they don't want to have to comply with laws that are difficult to execute against. Uh, and two, they would argue it's in their best interest to make sure that um, they are treating their users and their customers <clears throat> uh, correctly by self-regulating such that they continue to use the service. Uh, I had the opportunity with the IAB for several years to, to make an annual trip to, uh, to US Congress to, to lobby on behalf of the industry uh, because we self-regulated uh, as an industry for so long. It was one of the, the best you know, few days of, of my year because it was such a different world for me personally. Uh, but I also really got to, to see uh, the complexity that governments have when they're trying to regulate any industry. So here I was with a group of folks from the IAB explaining this and explaining why we're in the, we as an industry are best suited to, to self-regulate. And behind me was someone from the banking industry and behind them was someone from the farming industry and behind them was someone from, someone from, someone from. So to have the expectation that the governments can do this well and as fast as our industry moves is somewhat unreasonable, you know, my opinion. Um, but we're at a point where we're regulated. So we were a self-regulated industry for a long time, and now we are a regulated industry. Um, what, what went wrong? What went wrong? Well, uh, it, it's not so much that something went wrong as much as the world changed. Uh, the notion of what consumers expect has changed. The notion of what the obligations are between first parties, publishers, and advertisers in their relationship with consumers has changed. Uh, scandals have happened. So we, we live in an evolving time, and, uh, and that calls for a different set of rules that are, that are needed. And when you look at the world of self-regulation versus the world of actual regulation, there are material differences in approach. Uh, so the historical self-regulation model basically talked about opting out of third-party ad tech companies who process your data for advertising purposes. And the model that exists in actual regulations, in actual laws that are being enacted, say, that's, that's well and good, but that's all kind of complicated. First parties actually have the responsibility. Publishers and advertisers need to know what happens on their page and take responsibility for the relationship with the consumers because that's all the consumers really know. They don't know that list of, of ad tech companies. And I think the regulators got something right there. Uh, that was a, a, a very healthy evolution that has happened. And I think at the end of the day, while this is incredibly complicated and I do think that legislators have a challenge grasping this, when you're enacting laws, you're focusing first on principles. And if you have the principles right, then you got to make sure that you align the rules. And the reality is, this is a complicated data flow, but the next data flow in the healthcare industry is equally as complicated. So it's important that you get the principles right. And if you do that, you can align the legislation to be generally applicable. And it might be the case as exists, for example, in California now with CCPA in their most recent amendment, they created an agency that is responsible for drafting more specific rules. And they have greater expertise in doing that. Any thoughts on what went wrong? Yeah, I, I think we tried self-regulation. And we kind of noticed that there are limits to self-regulation. And the trust is just not there anymore for the tech companies to do that. But ultimately, I also think that because it's complex, because just the volume of data and, and the the way that digital markets work is that ultimately it is a form of partnership. That, that the governments cannot be doing the regulation without having the tech companies involved. So I mentioned, for instance, that the right to be forgotten, a GDPR, a, a rule. It's not somebody in Brussels making the call whether the, the, some information comes down. It is companies like Google right. that ultimately, in light of the principles, in light of the rules, are in charge of that implementation. The same way if we think about content moderation more broadly, there's nobody in Brussels sitting there and deciding what tweet is going up 
and what is coming down. It is these companies that are doing it. So ultimately, it is also the governments that are working with the companies in implementing the rules that are set by, by governments. So in, in that sense, the, the private companies are part of the, the, the solution, at least part of the, the big Yeah, from the, the media, it looks like a battle, but in practice, they're working together. To make yeah, they're working better. together. And I think many companies, including, I would say, Microsoft, I would sing a lot of the big tech giants, they have taken a rather collaborative approach. So I think they no longer fight regulation. I think they accept that regulation is part of the way the industry is going to be shaped, and they rather want to be part of the conversation in how do we adopt the kind of regulations that are pro-innovation, that do create better products. And I think that is the healthy approach to think yeah. about regulation, that ultimately we do not see the companies battle or try to lobby their way into or out of certain kind of regulation. But we try to figure out, because this is hard, but ultimately, I think most of us would agree it needs to be done. Yeah, that's fair. <clears throat> Microsoft learned a, a, a great lesson in yeah. the late 90s, right, yeah. for sure. They tried the other way, and they I did. don't think it worked. And I think right. they have adjusted, and it works better. Um, just a quick pause if there's any questions. I mean, otherwise, we'll keep moving on. Oh, great, yes. Um, so I come from the healthcare industry, and I, you mentioned a bit about like you know using user data or like patient data for certain reasons. Can you just share a bit more about like in the advertising world, how like you having my data might be really scary and dangerous to me, other than like you know the scary headlines of like we don't know what they're doing with it, but like what exactly are like some examples of people using my data when I'm like buying shoes um, in a negative way? That what's the consumer harm of having your data? Yeah, and I think to that. Help? As you mentioned, like the details of like, you know, people might be scared about like consumer like losing their privacy, but like what does that actually mean in terms of like what privacy am I losing versus like in the healthcare world, you know, I don't know how my insurance company in the future might use my genetic information. Right. Um, and that's like a more concrete example of like why you should be afraid of why someone might be afraid of like losing their patient it's a very good uh, question. health information. What's the consumer harm? Well, you know, we, we actually have not designed laws in privacy around consumer harm because it's very difficult to define the nature of the harm, which is why we come up with these prophylactic rules that sort of assume it. But in general, most of the consumer information that is used in the digital advertising context is used for advertising. Uh, and there are actually a lot of self-restraint that actually exists in contracts in the industry because of built-in economic incentives. So, for example, whoever has the direct relationship with the consumer typically has the strongest store of the consumer's data. So if you have a relationship with an advertiser because you've bought their product before, they typically know a little more information about you. Even if you're logged in on a publisher site, it's, it's the same thing. And so typically, when they enter into contracts, they don't want all of these other parties taking that data and doing anything they want with it. So they do have these incentives to impose restrictions on the data, and they typically do do that. And I'm not suggesting that that's a replacement for regulation, but by and large, absent some of the scandals that you see, your information that's used in advertising, is collected in an advertising context or a buy-sell context, is used for advertising purposes. So now, how does someone define a harm in that? You know, that's, that's a very subjective thing. Uh, if you feel a harm if you add something to your cart, you don't buy it, and then they retarget you on the next three websites that you go to. It's annoying, it's but it an, might not be is, harmful. Is that, right? is, well, I mean, there are some people who say they see, you know, a harm in that. Uh, some people say they are annoyed by that. There's some people who say, I don't care, and then some people buy it off of that. That's why they they do it. Um, but you know, th there are you know, occasional scandals where there's. Um, something that is uh, entirely improper that might happen where 
personal information that was collected is, is sold off to, to third parties for non-advertising type of purposes. It's, it's pretty rare, uh, but you know, it, it can happen, and it's typically not legal when it does happen. But um, hopefully that gives you a sense of it. I, mean, I may, may take a left turn. Do you have any thought on what? No, I, I think it's also very, very personal. <clears throat> there are some products probably that you necessarily would not be comfortable with everybody looking at your credit card statement. You don't want anybody, everybody in this room to know exactly how you spend your money, what products you buy, what kind of sort of priorities you have in life. And uh, so it may be, but sometimes I think you're absolutely right to start that certain industries like healthcare information is much more sensitive that it can have consequences and you don't want something to get in the hands of your insurance company or your employer. So there are sort of different degrees of privacy harm. Sometimes I think advertising is people treat as nuisance. The idea that you spam with something that you have been Googling, you really wanted to go on that vacation and you were just sort of dreaming about it and then you were just told that you just can't afford it and you can't do it. And yet the whole next year, all is spamming every day is that you're reminded of this, this thing that you wanted to do. That's probably not the same kind of harm that could be concrete in terms of your health information being compromised, but you would still prefer not to have that advertising coming to you every single moment. So, um, so there are certain things yeah. that I think that can be just a more in the nuisance category or something that you're not comfortable about and something that is truly can be sort of psychologically or financially cause you more sort of concrete harm. But ultimately, I think the, the, the starting point is it should be your choice in terms of like, you know, what is the advertising environment that is surrounding your daily interactions and how much it is shaped by financial, for instance, purchases and decisions and, and history that is still your personal history and you don't necessarily want to share with the entire world. And, and you know, as I was absorbing the question and listening to both of you, um, would you view what happened with Cambridge Analytica as using data in an advertising context as creating societal harm, if not individual harm, right? So, so possibly, right? I mean, that was, to, if you're not familiar with that, it was um, essentially trying to create uh, divisiveness in the U.S. before the election by targeting very specific people with profiles that they got from their advertising data and their Facebook data, right, primarily, um, to send them specific messages, right? So, uh, you know, maybe. So we could probably spend another hour on this topic as well. But. Based upon you know, any number of things. You might know where the person's located by virtue of you have their address because they've signed up for a subscription. Or you might be using their IP address to determine their location. And then a certain set of obligations get triggered. And if you're doing it right as a multinational company, you have a process flow about how to handle that information based upon the jurisdiction. I may add, I think Michael and I may have a slightly different view on this. I think I've written a lot on how we see actually a fair bit of standardization. So the companies who do not want to have a different privacy policy in different jurisdictions. So there's been many companies that have chosen the GDPR as their global privacy policy and extend it across their global customers. They may still be local variations, but there's, there's this foundational set of rules where, where the GDP is guiding the interactions. So sometimes, and I, I think the logic is generally like, if you think about customization or standardization, as long as the sort of the cost of uh, uh, tailoring your policies is higher than even sort of foregoing the more lenient protection some way and elevating the higher privacy standard. And partially you do it for sort of legal risk point of view. Sometimes there are scale economies. Sometimes there are sort of technical reasons why it's hard to separate your policies everywhere. Sometimes it's reputational. So it may be hard for Google to say that we care about Europeans' privacy, but we really don't care about what we do with American kids because it's just something that we can do it. We show the Europeans that we can do it. So I, I, I think we, maybe the truth is somewhere that we, we do see some tailoring but I would say we see it more in the margins as opposed to like completely jurisdiction by jurisdiction compliance program for these companies, just because it's often too unwieldy. But even doing it that way, there are secondary effects. So it's possible if, and these aren't the words you use, but I'll use, the, use them in my summary. If you use lowest common denominator, right, if you so, sort of have standardization, and in one region you are being more restrictive than you need to be, you open yourself up to competition to someone in that local market that 
chooses not to be. And then on the margin, you might actually just lose a little bit. And those are some of the debates that we had as well. You're right. That was the approach Google took, the way you described it. Uh, but does it mean we're putting ourselves at a, you know, at a dis disadvantage? I would just well, add to that. Um, it's one thing applying GDPR in a jurisdiction that effectively doesn't have a generally applicable data privacy law because you're making a policy judgment uh, be, that you want to extend privacy rights to a broader set of consumers and also because there's an efficiency in doing that. But as I, I've told a number of, of members and in different forums, if you basically say, I'm going to take GDPR and use that to comply with pick a, a country or a state's privacy law, you're doing it wrong. And you're violating the law in that particular country. Because the reality is, while you might say, hey, that is perception-wise, oh, it must be the highest and best practice. People started saying in, after CCPA was enacted in 2018 and everyone started getting ready in 2019, I should just be able to do what I did for GDPR because it's stricter, of course. Well, actually, it's like yeah. it's square peg and round hole. They just don't match at all. There's a specific set of rights that the state of California said you need to provide consumers. That is, there's some some overlap a little bit with GDPR, but it really doesn't fully match to any degree. And if you just took your GDPR program and you put it in California, you're doing it wrong. You would definitely be subject to an right, so add, But the add California complexity. is based on the GDPR. The GDPR often gave the impetus and basic blueprints. I think it, you're absolutely right that there are some differences. But the way often the companies may need to, and this is the concern of the industry, that you basically need to start picking the most stringent from different jurisdictions in order to have the compliance. The difficulty is that if you actually have inconsistent obligations, that you cannot have a standardized response. Well, there was a, there was a question here. I think you wanted to jump in on this topic. Right, is that true? Uh, similar, but like in emerging markets, I wanted to get your point of view on whether, uh, I mean, why, are, why is privacy not see, such a serious concern there? And uh, is it because uh, privacy is a luxury, or is it because governments are you know, not so much aware, or the public is not aware so much, or is it because, uh, because of some other reason, maybe, uh, you know, maybe indifference of, whatever the governments may be because they have so much to lose uh, and so much to gain if there is no privacy. I actually think that there is a significant movement towards privacy laws in emerging markets. Uh, we did an analysis at the IAB about a year and a half to two years ago called our Cross Jurisdiction Privacy Project where we looked at the development of privacy laws in 10 jurisdictions outside of the US and Europe. And we had 100 plus privacy lawyers from around the globe working on this. And everyone's supposition going in is that it's all going to look like GDPR. Right? And actually, it really didn't. You saw strains of concepts make their way in. But there were some material differences. And as you move into looking at emerging markets, there were a number of pending bills that we saw in India. Niger uh, Nigeria had just enacted a generally applicable privacy law. So, it's there. It's not, it's not in every emerging market, but it is growing in importance. So, uh, so I, think that's, I think that's a healthy development. I think there's about 130 countries that have a uh, privacy law. And I would argue that many of them either were inspired by the GDPR or were based actually very similar. Even the Chinese uh, privacy law takes the GDPR as a starting point and then adds the kind of Chinese elements to it that in, uh, occasionally takes it pretty uh, to a different direction. Um, but I think to your question, I think what I, what I take it to be that why um, there's still probably less of a consciousness or less enforcement is that, first of all, privacy, it's even the EU is struggling to enforce privacy. So I think it's sometimes the question of expertise and resources. And then there's also a different sort of baseline expectation of privacy in, in, in some uh, uh, jurisdictions. And then there are Places, for instance, where individuals say that, look, my main concern is not surveillance. My main concern is much deeper about my personal safety, for instance. So if there are surveillance cameras and facial recognition because it helps governments with crime control, I worry about that. Let them do that. So privacy is more of a luxury item and some criticism where the Europeans have been exporting kind of their view of the GDPR is that it may be something that the Europeans can afford to care about. 
but different societies have a different mix of concerns and privacy may not always fare as high in the agenda. You know, there's one, the, the irony of this conversation is, is one of the unintended consequences is that the companies that are most capable of managing the complexity of these multinational privacy laws are the biggest companies that were the impetus for the privacy laws to be written right, in the first place. So Google, Facebook, you know, name your large company, have the resources to comply to the law, build their products you know, in a certain way. Whereas if you are smaller and you're really making real implementation trade-offs in terms of how you use your, you know, allocate your resources to the company, you're likely at a big disadvantage. So I don't know if that comes up in your conversations with lawmakers, but in some regards, you're making it harder for smaller companies to compete yeah. with the larger companies. So uh, it's inevitably the case that there is a tension between uh, privacy and, and competition. The, the more privacy you're going to have, the less competition you're going to have, and also the impact that it's also going to have on smaller parties in, in the ecosystem. The smaller parties also help create a competitive landscape, and imposing regulations on them is something that is challenging. So, uh, so there is a, there is a cost-benefit analysis, mm -hmm. and that's what we have government make decisions to weigh these, uh, to weigh these uh, potential impacts. One thing I, I would say is, if you look at the digital landscape right now, in particular on the publisher side, there is a wide, massive variety of content that is available, most of which is free and is driven by an ad-funded model. And one of the challenges that we think is incumbent upon the IAB, for example, is how do we continue to allow this model to thrive where there's this free content, but help these smaller players in the industry comply? Because it is difficult. And so, for example, one of the things that we've spent the last year working on is a, a multi-state privacy agreement that takes the complexity of five state laws and creates an industry-wide agreement for companies to sign on to. And it will be agreed to by all of these other players downstream in the ecosystem. So you don't need to have a privacy lawyer on staff. You can sign up to what are, I'd say, a very uh, conservatively written set of privacy rules that are applicable to the transactions in which they participate. And that's a significant part of how we can help them along the way. But that's only part of the way. That's the contract. That's the legal stuff. That's complicated. It's expensive. But there's also engineering time that is typically required. So if you're a publisher and you're going to engage in this ecosystem, you need to be able to communicate through signals about what the consumer has elected under these different privacy laws. And that takes time and, and money to really do you it know, right. This was uh, to the point I was making earlier in the day. <clears throat> we would have to, or our engineering team would have to prioritize those features in the product so we could be legally compliant mm -hmm. at the expense of some things that our customers wanted. So for someone that was a product guy and not a lawyer, that was sort of frustrating. Kelly, you had a question a while ago, and I'm not sure if it's still relevant for it, It's not as relevant, but I really liked your image of the relationship between private companies and privacy laws as a partnership rather than a war. Yeah. I personally have never thought of it that way. But I'm curious how you think that is a sustainable model, because in my opinion, and I feel like maybe this is a US-centric view, it does feel a ch like a charged partnership, if it's a partnership. And do you think that, and, it, and also in my opinion, it feels like the, the private sector is winning. And so do you feel like the private sector needs to have some type of like benevolent or intrinsic motivation to be in partnership, or just naturally the population will demand them to follow suit with government. Yeah. So I think in many ways that the tech companies, unless they are completely not reading the room, do realize that, that people actually want more regulation. They want more privacy. 
when we think about artificial intelligence, people want it to be sort of ethical and trustworthy and to be able to, I think it can increase the uptake for technologies if people can trust them. So I actually think there could be kind of a common interest of having also regulation as the way of creating the consumer trust and, and, and making the marketplace more sustainable. And also for private companies to think about that they rather want the regulation to be thoughtful and, and kind of get there before it is fair complete. Uh, by the by the governments, but whether it's whether it's sustainable in the end, and and whether you can kind of get to that partnership can be kind of a would require both to engage in in good faith. But I think also the governments you said it's a complex world to, to right. regulate, and ultimately you do it better when the regulation um, just is sort of a, a, a incorporates the benefits of an understanding how the marketplace works. So I would like to think that there is a way to think about the governments working together with the companies and, and ultimately getting to the kind of that it that makes the enforcement easier for the regulators if you already have a buy-in from the market participant and it's not kind of a constant battle. But I think that, that companies at this point have no choice but to, to, to understand that they need to work with the regulators because they're being attacked from so many different directions. So already Michael said it's the privacy, it is the the antitrust, they now think about using the algorithms. So there's the AI regulation that will apply to them. Um, there's also sort of a, a, a bunch of what it comes from the content moderation side. So the companies would need to pick their battles. They can't be on an all out war and sort of with multiple jurisdictions across multiple different laws. And I don't think it's also the will of the regulators. They need to pick their battles. So ultimately, that hopefully creates the kind of the zone <laughs> Of, a, of a negotiations whereby we are trying to make sure that there's certain things that we just, just don't fight, but we agree upon. So we saw, for instance, Amazon now settle a very big uh, antitrust um, challenge in Europe. And I think it was partially to preempt that the Digital Markets Act and already opt in early on with the settlement that we are actually going to comply with these regulations. And we already talked about how Microsoft has just chosen to be, for instance, much more in line of let's try to shape these regulations together. I don't know, Michael, am I too optimistic uh, or do you actually well, think Well, I, I, I actually uh, fundamentally agree with, with what you're saying. Uh, partnership is key and we also need to recognize that industry is the junior partner in that relationship. Uh, there's a reason that governments have the power to, to set the rules. And the part of it I think I want to focus my remarks on is more on not the creation of the rules, but the implementation of the rules, right? It's one thing to create a law, a rule, but it's another thing to figure out how does it apply to that. And that's where I think partnership is critical. It requires a level of candor about what this looks like. I spend a lot of time speaking with regulators and discussing this is what it looks like, and here's how we try to solve for the problems ourselves. And the types of uh, agreements, for example, this multi-state privacy agreement, how we're trying to create the right relationships in the contracts and in the data flows to comply with the law. So it's very much about how do we, how do we educate them on what this looks like and also get input from them, because there are a tremendous number of decisions that are made each year by a chief compliance officer that they actually don't know the answer to. You've got a law that is new. It's never been applied. There's no cases. There's no regulations that, that specify in a particular circumstance. So the best thing that you can do is make the best judgment you can. But if you have a means of collaborating with the regulator, and having an interaction and a dialogue to talk about these issues, it's tremendously beneficial, mm -hmm. I think, for, for the industry. Any last questions before we wrap up? Yeah, I, I just think um, tying up all the, all the conversations that we just had, what's your opinion on the recent you know, TikTok you know, like the states is trying to ban TikTok, and you know the companies trying to win the case on the court. And um, so, like, I was wondering, what do you think? Do, do you think that TikTok is compliant with the G GDPR? And like, what's the reason that the states is um, banning the, the app? I think there's a different problem being addressed in that than GDPR. But you go ahead. <laughs> 
So this would be a totally worthy of another panel. So yeah, right. instead of like, we probably can't go there. It's a terrific question. I think it's really interesting also how that conversation is unfolding on the European side. So the Americans have been much more fixated on, on TikTok. So let me just tie it to today's conversation. To me, the way the Americans should handle TikTok is to adopt the federal privacy law and have a much more principled way to address many concerns, whether it's the European data flows with the Europeans to try to have to be more on the same page, but also have That's that fair. kind of legislative framework that is used to think about you know, privacy in the context of TikTok. So it just doesn't get, get folded into the broader tech war with China and, and the question that just becomes very charged and not only about privacy in the same principle way that would be tied to law. So I think that would be the best way to awesome. deal with that. But there's much more that we could say about then since we don't have whether we ought to be asking for the sale uh, of the company. But it's very interesting how TikTok has been able to leverage, for instance, the American courts to last time to fend off some of the requirements by the government. But let me just say a simple answer would be federal privacy law would get us a long way in trying to address the TikTok problem as well. Excellent. All right, so last question. Um, how many years will it take before we have a stasis globally as it relates to data privacy where we all can operate as industry? Is it one year, five years, 30 years? Um, when more or less the law just sits in the background and it works and everyone just complies. Never. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean. So your answer is never. <laughs> never. never. Well, Job if, security. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I, I fall into that camp. I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine where any other law in any other context where that actually happens. Uh, you know, take healthcare, pharmaceuticals, yeah. you know, highly regulated industries. It's never sitting in the background. They're dealing Fair with point. it every day. It's on the Fair floor. point. Well, um, thank you both very much for joining us. <laughs>